I was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. It is wonderful to be with you here today. Today we are looking at the very familiar story of Mary and Martha. This is found in Luke 10. Before we get deep into the story, we're actually going to take a little side trip, but I'm going to start reading anyway, just so that we can kind of set this up. Starting in Luke 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had to say. Now I want to stop right here because what is happening here just kind of gets glossed over, but it's extremely important because this is unusual in this culture. Women are not allowed to sit at the feet of the disciples, at the feet of the rabbis, to listen to what is being taught. This is a very male-dominated society. It is very chauvinistic, and women are not treated well. And for Jesus to allow this to happen makes a statement about how he feels about women that is revolutionary for his time and his culture. See, normally you would say, okay, they would say, the man is to come home and teach the woman the ways. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to teach directly. Women have value. We see this also back in Luke 8. We didn't cover this at the time we were in Luke 8. But Luke 8, verse 1, after this, Jesus traveled from one town to in village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women. 
who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven de- de- demons had been come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. Women are traveling around with the disciples. And this just goes to show Jesus' revolutionary, uncharacteristic for his time approach to women. Jesus treated women with dignity. Jesus treated them as though they were people. You can't make a full case for it, but honestly, I believe he treated them as equal to men. Very valid point to bring out that Jesus doesn't care whether you're male or female. He loves you just the same. So let's go in. Let's continue our story. Let's get into the whole Mary Martha thing. So starting back at Luke 10, 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came in and asked, Lord, don't you care my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about so many things. But few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, I'm not going to get into the usual Martha-Mary debate. You know, I'm not going to get into the type A, type B personality. I'm not going to go there, because I want to go a different direction today. How many of you have ever gone through a day? And you just like run, 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 run. Go from point A to point B. It's just like nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. All day long and you get to the end of the day and you say, I didn't get anything done. Yeah, everybody's probably had that day. In fact, really, if we were to be truthful about it, we would probably say that the majority of our days fit that description. Back in 1967, a man named Charles Hummel wrote a booklet called The Tyranny of the Urgent. Called a booklet because it's only four and a half pages long. A little summary of this. The tyranny of the urgent is the great enemy of the effect of life. It is easy to get so caught up in the rush of things that we forget what is really important. We become so busy doing things, we have no time to think about what we should be doing. We become so busy responding to the demands of others, we have no time to respond to the call of God on our lives. That's worth reading again. We become so busy responding to the demands of others In our lives, we have no time to respond to the call of God. Have you ever felt like that? You ever felt like everybody else has dictated your time except for you? Guilty. So as we look at this, the statement here is important. It says we're so busy doing things. Responding to the demands of others. So what are these demands of others? What are these expectations that other people have? Turns out we have them too. Where do they come from? Where do they come from? Because to fix this problem of running around like kooks and not getting anything done and not being able to do God's work, we've got to understand where the problem is coming from. So Let's take a look at where these demands and expectations come from. And as I started exploring this, I found they came from a wide variety of different places. Sometimes this is the expectations of others. It often starts with the expectations of others. 
You know, let's imagine that you are in a civic club. Let's just pick that for a great example. And it is expected of you, because you are in this civic club, to participate in their events and to help them with their service projects and to go sell whatever they are selling to raise money. It is expected behavior because you're a member of this club. It is a demand, if you want to go that extreme, that gets put on you. Peer pressure. We think of peer pressure and we tend to think of youth. After all, when we were teens, peer pressure was a very big problem, still is a big problem to people today. Peer pressure continues on. Let me give you an interesting Example, let's say that there's a group of guys hanging out and they're just kind of talking and there's one guy who's got who's shooting his potty mouth off. Blah, 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 blank, 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 blank. And let's say that I walk up and I join this group and just kind of listening in. And then one of the other people from the group of men who are standing around talking, one of them says, oh, well, Pastor Foster, Pastor Larry, how are you doing today? Well, what happens with the guy with the potty mouth? Well, he kind of, he'll shut his powder potty mouth up. Why? Peer pressure. It is the effect of someone else in the group changing your behavior. That happens here. It happens everywhere. That someone will move into the group and it will change how the group works. It's kind of fascinating to watch. If I started wearing sackcloth and ashes on Sunday mornings, it might affect how people dressed. If I wore tuxedo every Sunday morning... I would presume that people would start dressing a little bit better. Or in the first case, maybe a little worse. See, our influence group, the people around us, have expectations on us, and it changes what we do. There are expectations our culture puts on us. If, you've, if you're from the South, you will totally understand this. But if you are from the South, people will drop in on you with no warning. They will just pop right over. They are in the neighborhood. Maybe they're not in the neighborhood. It does not matter. To drop in on somebody in the South is common and it happens, okay? And if someone drops in on you and you do not offer them a glass of iced tea and something to eat, you are considered a bad host or Hostess is the case. It's cultural. It's cultural down south. This is what is expected of you. This is the demands that the culture puts on you. So sometimes these demands that we have in our life are coming from our culture. It's coming from what we have. Sometimes these are expectations we put on ourselves. Sometimes we put on ourselves expectations to be this wonderful husband, this wonderful wife, this wonderful parent, this wonderful grandparent. And somehow, somewhere, we have conceived these expectations. Somewhere we have come up with this idea of, oh, this is what a wonderful husband, wife, parent, grandparent is. And we become bound by these expectations. These are expectations we put on ourselves. They may be influenced by our culture. They may be influenced by other people. But the thing is, we're the ones that put them on ourselves. We are the ones that are trying to own up to this. That's kind of what Mary has fallen into. Martha, <laughs> I get mixed up today. It's what Martha has fallen into today. She has this standard of... I need to do this and this and this and this and this because this esteemed rabbi has dropped in on me. Where did she come up with that? We do not know. But we do know that those demands and those expectations are about to cause her to miss a word from God. That's sad. 40, Mary, verse 40 again, Mary was distracted by all the preparations. I already gave you this answer. Distracted from what? She's distracted from the teachings of Jesus. Now, you know, everybody didn't quite understand who Jesus was at that point in time. They figured he was a pretty cool guy. 
didn't quite understand that he's like God and he's the Messiah. But I can bet you that if Jesus was sitting in person right here and it was up to me to either fix dinner or listen to him, we're probably eating cold cuts. DoorDash. Yeah, exactly. She's distracted from what? She's distracted from the teachings of Jesus because she has this concept that she's trying to meet the expectations that she has put in her brain of what she has to do. So we know what the problem is. The problem is that there are demands being put on us by our culture, by friends, by family. There are things that people expect us to do that keep us from doing the will of God. That's the problem. How do we get around it? How do we break this cycle of tyranny of the urgent? Well, it starts with the end in mind. You got to figure out where you're going in order to get there. Makes perfect sense. How often do you go on a trip? Whether that's the first thing you do, you pull out a map, whether it's electronic or whether it's hard copy, it doesn't matter. What's the first thing you do? You figure out where you're going. We're going on vacation. Where are you going? You open up the map. You point it on the map. I am going here. What is the first thing we need to do? We need to figure out what our destination is. We have to begin each day with the end in mind. We have to remove ourselves. And to find that out, we have to remove ourselves from the distractions. Martha's problem, we got to, which was Martha's problem, we got to remove ourselves from the distractions and talk to God. How many times in the Gospels does it say Jesus went off and prayed? I don't know. I never have counted it. It all starts with prayer. It all starts with prayer. Here is Jesus. He is completely man. He is completely God. And he still spends a lot of time in prayer. How much more do we need to spend in prayer? It all starts with prayer. And we did this as a church. When we were putting together our ministry plan for the year, we started with prayer. And we believe so much in creating a plan, a direction for the year that we built that. It's obligated. It's in the bylaws. Every year, we got to come up with a plan. And where does it start? It starts with prayer. It starts with praying. It starts with saying, God, where do you want me to go? You know, the worst, wor worst excuse in the world is, we've always done it that way. Oh, man, that is the worst excuse. That's the best reason in the world for questioning why you're doing it. Just because it was God's will three years ago or five years ago does not mean it is His will today. So it starts. I mean, as a church, we did that. We started with prayer. As individuals, it's the same thing. It starts with us going to God. It starts with us on our knees saying, God, what is your call on my life? That's what it is. That's where it starts. And it's not just a one-off thing. It's something you do all the time, because God is constantly revealing himself to each person who seeks him. Seek and you will find. Take time to ask. Seek God. Listen. I like this quote. Jesus did not complete all the urgent things there were to do when he was on the earth. There were probably towns that would have liked for him to have come by. There were probably people who would have liked to have been healed. You know, but he did completely everything the Father wanted him to do. Notice the difference. Jesus didn't complete the urgent. He completed the mission. And it all starts with prayer. It all starts with prayer. Another fun quote, P.T. Forsyth, don't know who he is, but it had a fun quote. The root of all sin is self-sufficiency. It's true, okay? Saying that I am God, God you are not. Independence from God. When we fail to wait prayerfully for God's guidance and strength, we are saying with our actions, if not our lips, 
We do not need him. To not pray, to set out on our own course is to violate the first commandment. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods but but me. And when we say, oh, I got a better idea than you, God. Guess who just became God in our lives? Moa, you're right. You know, I have challenged everybody to pray at least 20 minutes a day. I have challenged this group before to do that. And I figure, okay, if I make that challenge, then I need to be up to it. If I make a challenge, if I say you guys need to do this, well, I got I to gotta be the example. I got to be up to it. And every morning when I come into church, that's what I do. I will come up here to the sanctuary and it's beautiful and it's quiet and the phone is downstairs. So if it rings, I don't hear it and there are no distractions. And I will take 20 minutes every day to pray with God. We collect prayer requests in a variety of different ways. We correct, collect them in our service. We collect them in our Bible studies. We collect them in a variety of different ways. And that's, that's some of the things I pray about. Is these requests that you entrust to us. And that's what I do. And I have to say that... It started real easy. I'll I'll be totally honest at this point. It started very easy. And then, oh, I don't know, somewhere around day five, day seven, somewhere like that, I'm coming in and I've got a to-do list that's as long as my arm. It's what? Urgent. Okay. And I've got this long to-do list. And it's like, oh, I got to get through this stuff. How am I going to do it? I don't have time to pray. And it's like, no. I need to do that. I need to pray and trust God that He is going to help me get through this list if I devote time to Him. It works. It's tough at times. There's days you just don't want to do it. But I have to confess that after doing it for several months that I really look forward to it. And I miss the days where I don't do it, like maybe I'm traveling or something. It all starts with prayer. It all starts with us seeking God and finding what is the end. Start with the end in mind. After you figure out which direction you're going, then you can determine whether or not this is going to take you on the right path. Go back to the vacation model. You say, we're going on vacations. Well, where are we going on vacation? We're going here on the map. Okay, we're going to go to Yellowstone. We're going to pick Yellowstone. Okay, I'm going to Yellowstone. And from where we're at right now, Yellowstone is north. And so if you said, well, well, let's go south, you would not be going toward your destination. You would not be going to the correct location. See, after we know what the end is, after we know... What the end is, then we can determine whether these steps we are going to take today lead us in that direction. That's the next thing. We define the goal. We define where the end is. And then you can tell whether or not you're moving in the right direction. As you plot your day, you can figure out whether or not this is the right way to go. You know, as a church... That's what we do too. We we have the end goal. Our mission statement is to reach people who need to know Christ and reach those who have strayed from Him. And the people who are already here, our goal is to draw them closer to God. That's it. And so if you plan an event, you look at it and you say, is this bringing us to this point? Is this getting us this direction or not? Everything we do has to fit into where we are going. Why do you do what you do? Does it take you to where you are going? Is this 
goal achieving or is it, you know, tension relieving? Quote from Dennis Whaley. So let's look back at Martha. Let's go back to Martha. And here is Martha and she's running around trying to make all these preparations because she thinks that's what she has to do in this situation. And she's about to miss out on hearing from God right there in person. Boom. Wow. Don't be so busy that you miss out on a word from God. Yeah, I wonder if that's ever happened to me. I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has. I'm sure there's been times that I have been so busy running around doing my to-do list. I did not hear God. Martha's about to hit that same situation. Don't be so busy doing things you miss out on a chance to hear from God. How do we get around the tyranny of the urgent? Well, we got to figure out why we do what we do. But more importantly, we need to go back and figure out where we are headed. Where does God want us to go? As a church, as an individual, as a family, where does God want us to go? What is that point on the map? What is that point on the horizon that we need to aim for? And then we need to look at our to-do list every day and say, does this take me there? And if it does, then you're in the right path. And if not, well, we need to learn to say no. Follow God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for what we can learn through this story. Lord, we just uh, draw comfort from it. But more than that, it shows us how we can get caught up so much in the day-to-day, the to-do-to-dos, and miss the most important thing. Mary has chosen the most important thing and it cannot be taken from her. Lord, just help us to be sensitive to you. Help us be disciplined that we pray. We pray every day for your spirit, for your guidance. Lord, may we be your people in everything we do. In your name we pray. Amen.